Welcome to the Taxing Subjects Podcast brought to you by Drake Software. I'm your host, Ryan Norton, and I'm joined today by Drake Software's Vice President of Strategic Development, John Sapp. Hey, Ryan. Hey, John. Welcome to the show. Great to be here. <laughs> now, I understand that you serve on various uh, industry groups as a Drake Software representative, like ETAC, Circa, and the Security Summit. What are those groups focusing on? And uh, as we look towards the 2018 filing season, are there any concerns? Is there optimism, mixture of both? What's the top priority? Well, actually, um, all of those groups, you know, work very closely with the Internal Revenue Service and State Departments of Revenue. Um, the main focus right now, which is one of the, obviously, what we have to do is look at the news headlines to kind of figure that out. Um, is identity theft and refund fraud. And most of those groups are figuring out ways to collaborate together to help serve the American taxpayer. It's, it's become almost a cliche, uh, but it is the reason that we do what we do is that all of our interests are aligned in that, uh, you know, fraud and identity theft all impact the ability of the tax system, or some folks would say the tax ecosystem. Um, you know, from from the beginning to end is all impacted whenever a fraudulent return um, impacted by identity theft enters that system. And so all of those groups at vary, from various perspectives um, are focused on that issue in one way or another. Although there are a lot of other issues that, uh, that may hit the table, but those identity theft and refund fraud is probably the number one issue all of those groups are dealing with. Well, what has it been like to work with them, with the IRS, with those state tax agencies at the Security Summit? Um, is this considered an unprecedented collaboration? Um, just having all these people, these stakeholders, in one room addressing these problems? Well, um, I wish it was in one room. Um, <laughs> it started out that way. The IRS Commissioner, John, Commissioner Koskinen, um, saw the need, saw all of the um, ID theft returns coming into the system, and realized that the, the issue was bigger than just the Internal Revenue Serv Service processing those returns. Um, and so he called in the, the CEOs of all the major tax software companies um, from banks that process financial products um, to the State Departments of Revenue. He called all them into one room and had a literal summit um, in Washington, D.C., in which we participated and um, discussed the issue. And out of that, it wasn't just a uh, showpiece meeting where nothing occurred. Actually, out of that meeting came working groups that to this day, three four years later, are still active and are still having calls, um, some on a weekly basis, some on a monthly basis, to help give direction to how do we fight ID theft and refund fraud. So that collaboration, what we've seen over the last two or three years, is, is really is unprecedented. I mean, really, a, the, the level of um, willingness to cooperate with each other for a common goal to help the, the taxpayers um, combat identity theft and refund fraud. Um, you know, the level of cooperation that we've seen between the Internal Revenue Service and the State Department's Revenue really is, uh, in, in my, you know, 25 years in the, the tax business, um, I've, I've never experienced that. What would you think the big wins are that are currently coming out of the Security Summit in this well, collaboration? Well, we've seen um, identity theft refund fraud returns, you know, drop in half over the last couple of years. So we, statistically speaking, um, you know, we've, we've seen an impact in the number of taxpayers that are being impacted in the tax arena. Um, and and that's, that's a victory, but it's also we all knock on wood whenever we talk about that victory because we've all seen... Um, you know, with the data breaches and, and any p particular security in incident that may occur, um, you know, wins in the security interest uh, in industry or in the secu as you're trying to put together protocols to impact, you know, that are security related, it changes so fast that it's a short-lived victory. So we never really consider the battle won, um, but we have at least seen some great results, uh, which the bottom line is fewer taxpayers have been impacted. So would you say then that the industry as a whole uh, feels optimistic through this collaboration um, with the IRS, with the state and uh, state agencies. Sure, yeah. So, so we're very optimistic about the collaboration, right? And mm -hmm. as I said, um, a lot of us are, are accountants by nature, and so we're fairly. Some would call us pessimistic. I think Benjamin Franklin would probably call us realistic. Um, you know, we're cautiously optimistic. We're very optimistic about the collaboration. 
um, you know, there are some, some ways that we feel like we could collaborate better, more efficiently if the IRS, um, you know, potentially didn't have as many um, uh, regulatory requirements to keep them from sharing certain pieces of data about fraud, um, you know, so that we could, Im we could begin to develop processes to, to um, combat that on the front end as opposed to in the back end of the process. Uh, there, there's still some challenges there, but I'm extremely optimistic at the level of interest that we see uh, from not just the Security Summit participants, normal participants you would mm -hmm. think of, like tax software companies or large franchises participated in that or tax preparer groups. But now we're seeing that expand to regular tax return preparers who have security issues of their own, and we'll also see payroll companies are becoming more involved in that process. We've seen a lot of uh, W-2 fraud, you know, over the last few years with the phishing schemes where a CEO will get a, um, an email that says, hey, this is, this is your CFO. I need all the W-2 data for all these employees. And we've had some companies that have fallen for that. And so that puts good W-2s on the market, which can be turned into um, tax returns that look like they're good because they've got the real W-2 data. So we've seen the expansion into that arena with the payroll processors. We've seen the expansion more into the bank side where they actually can identify refunds before they go, before they actually get issued to the individual. They can identify ones that may look fraudulent based on other patterns that they see in the financial sector. So um, we're seeing that expansion. I'm very optimistic about that. And I think that really that, that is what it's going to take is that collaborative effort over a wide variety of things that impact that tax filing process. Do you think then that the industry is ever going to get ahead of the thieves and um, can that happen in the foreseeable future? Are you asking me if I'm ready to declare victory? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. We, we will, the, it is an ongoing battle that we can win individual battles but the war continues. As long as there's a financial incentive uh, for someone to file a fraudulent tax return uh, or file a tax return with a fraudulent ID because mm -hmm. uh, it's identity theft that we're really focused on. Uh, as long as there's a financial incentive for them to do that, there will always be a creative process on the, the, in the bad sense of the word that's going to uh, incentivize them to come up with new ways uh, to file those tax returns and get those refunds. Mm -hmm. And as long as that's occurring, as long as that financial incentive is there, we will always have a battle that needs to be fought. So I don't, I don't know that it's one that we would actually put a flag in the ground and say this is over. Um, it is one that is an ongoing process that we can get better at and respond more yeah. quickly. All right, so then what would be, if you had to give tax preparers advice on this issue, what would be the one thing about data security that they should know out of the list of many things? Okay, so... Um, you saw the list of industry groups that, that I'm involved with today, and I will tell you one thing about uh, meetings that occur in or around or out of Washington, D.C. No one ever answers the question that you ask. Um, <laughs> and I, I'm, I, I've been influenced by that, but if there's one thing, it has to be awareness. Uh, tax preparers have to be aware that they are a potential target, that they mm -hmm. have um, a treasure trove of information that can be translated from just data into a tax refund that doesn't go to the right taxpayer that goes to a fraudster. They have to be aware and hopefully that awareness, now I've given you one thing, now I'm going to give you the sub points, right? So yeah. um, hopefully that awareness leads to things like, I mean, the one thing we saw in the Equifax breach was they, they have the security plan, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they had backups, they had processes, they had people, they had computers double checking the people. All it took was one update not being installed for a vulnerability that was known. Mm -hmm. One update. And that one update exposed hundreds of millions of, of consumers' data. So they have everything. Mm -hmm. All of your security questions, all your super secrets, not just your social security number, name and address. All it took was that one patch not being installed. So they had the awareness, but they didn't have the execution. So they have to be aware and they have to be willing to inconvenience themselves like, okay, there's a patch that came out. We have to stop what we're doing and make sure that this critical piece, this patch, all of my systems are patched, all of my updates are installed. I have automatic updates turned on. 
All of those things occur. That's a very simple, a simple thing, but it's always the sim. Um, one of the criminal investigators from the Internal Revenue Service would tell the story at our schools, our training schools last year, about you know several years ago we had an individual that jumped the fence. You know the, the most secure place in the world is the White House. Yeah. Snipers on the roof, Marines at the front door. You know incredible security systems everywhere, bulletproof glass. You know the most important person is the president. He's in the White House. You would think it would be extremely difficult to get in. Well, a few years ago, we had a guy jump a fence, made it all the way inside two or three different layers, I understand, uh, before he was finally tackled and stopped. How did that happen? All of the security measures were in place, but somebody left the door open. Yeah. So a very simple um, process that didn't occur. They had the proper procedure, but it, you know the door wasn't locked. And, and that, that's really what happened to Equifax. They didn't lock that one simple door. And that's the one thing that preparers should be aware of is <clears throat> if you're having remote access into your computers because you feel like you need to work from home, don't use the same password that you use for your Yahoo account. Use a very long, complex password that's in compliance with some of the best standards in the industry, which right now we're applying NIST-53 standards is what they're called. So make sure you have a complex password and make sure you don't use that anywhere else. A lot of our tax return preparers are, um, they have a security problem because they've used the same password there that they were using on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. which got hacked and all those passwords were available. The hacks are, the fraudster takes that information, tries the same password and, and um, email address combination at a hundred different websites until they hit one and then they're in. And if you use that for your network, they're in your network. So just simple things like that, which, which don't require a lot of investment, they don't require a lot of time, they just require awareness. So I would say the number one thing is that being aware. And regarding the Equifax breach, you know, there's, like you said, there's a lot of private data out there, very sensitive data, and that may increase the likelihood of security issue events for your average person on the street. As aside from the idea that you know people will have their uh, fraudulent tax returns filed, what does that really mean for the average person on the street when it comes to, well, I've had my information stolen? There's a host of other issues related to that, but specific to uh, tax theft, <laughs> refund, fraud, what does that mean for them? Well, um, anytime there's a large data breach of quality information, what that means is the likelihood of a fraudulent tax return being filed on behalf of a taxpayer goes up, right? That, that's, we would all expect that. Um, we would hope that we would be able to um, identify those returns based on some of the security measures that we have in place on the, the, the processing side. That's the hope. Mm -hmm. um, but the better the data, the harder it is to identify, as, as we talked about earlier with the W-2s um, being spoofed. Um, so, you know, what it means for the person on the street is they, they have to be vigilant. One of the recommendations, uh, the ETAC board that I serve on, which is the electronic, it's an advisory council to the Internal Revenue Service, and they make recommendations um, for the electronic tax filing and the security summit. So one of the pieces of advice that we gave them uh, w w that we gave the Internal Revenue Service was to give taxpayers the ability to lock and unlock their account at the IRS. So as long as that account is locked, a return can't be filed. And then the taxpayer would need to go in and unlock the account, and then they can file a tax return. It's similar to, um, not that it would do any good now that Equifax has been breached, but um, you, know, you, you may have a lock on your credit report. You can right. do a permanent lock or a 90-day lock. And if you do that permanent lock, they issue you a very large um, pin, and um, that encryption key allows you to unlock your credit while you may want to apply for a mortgage, and then you can go back in and relock it so that you don't get credit card offers or credit card companies aren't checking your credit report without you knowing about it. And so, right. um, although when that gets breached and the hacker now has my pin, then it doesn't, you know, that fallback position is not there anymore. But um, that, that's, that to me is one of the things that the IRS should and I believe they are considering doing for taxpayers and allowing them to do that. The second thing is that if a taxpayer believes they've been breached, they should go ahead and get an IP pin from the IRS, which is a filing pin that they would use 
um, in order to file their tax return, um, it's ID, ID pin, ID protection pin, IP pin, I think. Um, I get the pins mixed up. But that pin will give them a code that is required to file their tax return that's unique to them, and it's reset every year, so they would get a new pin every year. Um, right now, it's available automatically to folks in Florida, Georgia, and D.C. Why they picked those three states, I don't know. Or if you can show them you've been a, a victim of identity theft, which with the Equifax breach, I would think you could. And you can receive that IP pin from the Internal Revenue Service and provide that when you file your tax return. That, to me, is another obvious protection that tax, taxpayers have that protection today. And they can get that, and I highly recommend that they do if they feel like they might be at risk. Or even if they don't feel that way, I still think it's a good idea. Gotcha. I do want to say that to everybody listening and watching, um, we'll see you next time on the next episode of the Taxing Subjects podcast.